guys are what? 20 million, 25 million people. There's more people inside the M25 in England. And yet you guys, you held World Cups after World Cup after World Cup. We get excited if we make a final. And uh, that's the truth of the matter. So to play against Australia was always the ultimate challenge. And to keep coming back here and enjoying myself in Australia and New Zealand uh, is um, terrific. To the extent now that we've got vineyards down here and uh, making wine, it's another excuse to come back and enjoy the great hospitality of this country. But yeah, it was a choice I made and cricket was the obvious one for me. Look, the Ashes is what every England player and every Australian player wants to play. That's the series. The convicts feed the palms. It's very simple. It goes back years and years and years. It's where cricket, every single cricketing nation watches the Ashes. To beat Australia is great, but to beat Australia in Australia is a magnificent feeling from a professional sportsman's point of view. Not for you, but it's not always going to be for you. But we came down, I remember in 86-7, we arrived and we were given no chance whatsoever. We arrived to play uh, a side that Australia, which who at that time were considered the best in the world. We came down, written off by everybody. We get into um, the hotel, off the plane, turn the television on, and what's on? They've got this picture of this six foot six kangaroo knocking seven barrels out of Lenny the Lion. Bring on the ashes, England are here, we're going to hammer them. It was the other that went on, it kept on, rolled on and rolled on. By the time we'd won the ashes, back, uh, retained the ashes in Melbourne by the Christmas test, Boxing Day test, the ashes, that suddenly that all disappeared. And we had an advert for rugby league in three months' time. I wouldn't say Australians are one eyed, but uh, a little parochial, but uh, no, it was, that, that's what it's about. It's about beating each other, the old enemy. Uh, people still, they say test cricket is dying. Every single England-Australia test match, whether it's here or in England, is sold out for four days. Test cricket is far from dead. I played with two guys who stood out as captains or as leaders. Uh, there was Mike Brearley, uh, who a lot of you guys I'm sure will have heard of. Mike Brearley, um, he had a degree in people. He got the best out of players. He antagonised the opposition. I remember Lenny Pascoe playing for, we called him the separatist. And Lenny never quite worked that out. But Mike Brearley had this knack of getting the best out of what players could offer, what was available at the time. But the guy who set the careers up for myself and Viv Richards in particular, we shared a house for 10 years, which was a wonderful experience until the wives put a stop to it. But we had this magnificent rapport. We grew up together. And Brian Close, one of the hardest men that I think ever played any form of sport, he uh, took us under his wing and... Brian Close would walk through a brick wall, did walk through brick walls for his country, and he was a leader. He led by example. There are many ways of being a leader. Some do it with talk and with motivation. He actually was the first man through the door, and that's why I think we all respect him. But you did not want to travel with him to away games, because if you can imagine sitting on a motorway in England, and your captain's there, and he's driving, and in the well here, he's got his beef and mustard sandwiches, He's got his pot of flask of tea. He's got his packet of 20 Benson and Edges. And he's driving down the motorway with the window open, cigarette on, reading The Sporting Life, which is a big racing paper in the UK. And he's got it over the steering wheel. And he's reading it. But he's not reading the headlines. He's reading the actual form. And he's going down. You're sat there as a young kid, and you're doing 80 miles an hour in the outside lane. That gets the adrenaline pumping before you start playing. Well, you find out the adrenaline's brown, whichever way you want to put it. <laughs> but uh, it, was, uh, it was a very formidable uh, man, and if he asked you to do something, you did it. But he was the first. He would get stuck into you on the field if you got it wrong, but he'd always be the first one, when he got it right, to come and put an arm around you. And we learnt so much from that attitude and that willing to win, wanting to win, and willing his team to win. Uh, Brian Close was the standout man for us. Sadly died a few months ago. England were playing Pakistan in a one-day international, 50-over game, and we're playing at Trent Bridge, which is Nottingham, and it's a flat wicket, it's a glorious day. England had a strong side at that stage, and we felt that we could put, win the toss, we'd put Pakistan into bat, because whatever they got, we would be able to run down. We, we fancied ourselves it was that good a surface. So we do that, we win the toss, Pakistan made about 250 in their 50-overs, and we're up in the changing room and just getting ready to go out. The bat opening batsmen are getting padded up. 
I've got a horse running at Ascot in the straight mile, and we've got the TV on in the dressing room, and in those days you were allowed to have mobile phones in the dressing room before the days of ringing up the bookies before you went out. And we're there watching the race, and I'm sat there, and Alan Lamb's over here. The England openers are getting padded up. David Gower's number three. Uh, number four was uh, Mike Gatting, if we could get him out of the tea room. And everybody was there, padded up. Horses in the paddocks. Lammy stood here. Opening batsmen go out. And uh, bring up the bookies. The horse is looking good. I have 100 pounds on the horse. And Lammy sat next to me. Hey, Jesus Christ, Beefy, I'll have 100 as well, eh? With that strong Northamptonshire accent. And he's there. Horses go down, the batsmen go out. Three, three four balls into the innings. Chris Broad uh, nicks it, caught behind. Father of Stuart Broad now. Wicket down, David Gower goes out. Alan Lamb sat next to me. Listen, hey, Lubo, get out there and just block it. I want to see the race. <laughs> so the race is there. They're coming out of the paddocks. They're walking the horses down to the start of the straight mile at Ascot. And as they're going down, I said, look, I think I'm going to put some more money on Lammy. Put another hundred pounds on Lemmy. Hey, Jesus, put another pound, hundred on for me. Okay. Start to load up the horses. Lemmy's in at two into bat. Next man in. Another week has gone down. He's there. He's padded up. He's ready to go. Literally, next ball, Gower's out. He has to go in. Lemmy wants to know the result of the race. Listen, Beefy, what's going to happen? You've got to tell me. I said, easy. And I picked up these phones. They were like bricks, those things in those days. Put it in his pocket. Off he went. I said, I'll take it with you and I'll give you a ring and let you know what <laughs> So off he goes, out into the middle and he has nowhere to dump the phone because at Trent Bridge it's just wall-to-wall -wall punters. So he goes down onto the pitch and he walks out and Dickie Bird was one of the umpires but he's at the non-striker's end. So Dickie Bird, one, he walks straight up to Dickie Bird and Dickie Bird says, come on Lammy, get down that end, let's be up and get on with the game. He said, listen Dickie, just put this in your pocket. If it rings, take a message. <laughs> now, you've got to understand that Dickie comes from Barnsley in South Yorkshire and they're still shoving pigeons outside uh, through windows now. They, that's the nearest to telecommunication they have. And he goes out there and my predicament now is if I'm going to send this, press the button to send the phone call or to make connection with the phone, I've got to get it right. Because if you're going to get hung, you might as well get hung for the whole sheep. So I'm there and I get one of the boys to sit in the dressing room on the other side and we worked out that Wacker Eunice, who was bowling, the time he got to the end of his run, he turned, scratching the, sorry, shining the ball, and when he got to the end there, <laughs> as he hit his plate to come in, if I, we watched it for three or four balls to get it right. As soon as he hit the plate, as Mark to come in, he came in quickly, Wacker Eunice, hit the button, send. Hit the send button, and everybody now is on the player's balcony. So that Lammy knows something's about to happen. Because he can see the, bat, the people that did the teas, the girls that did the laundry, the guys that whitened the gear, everybody is on the balcony. And we're there, and Baka Eunice comes running in. He gets to about here, and Dickie Bird, the phone explodes in his pocket, and he throws his arm out, nearly decapitates Baka Eunice, <laughs> takes out the Pakistan captain. How that player's balcony is still there, I don't know, because it was literally going like this as everyone's <laughs> laughing. End of the game, I said to Lammy, I said, we're in for it now. Press conference, they called Dickie in. And they've been after Lammy and myself for a long time, so they were going to throw the keys away if they got us. And they go down to the press conference, and Dickie's there, and he stood there. And I looked, and I thought, this is it, it's the end. And he said, they said to him, uh, John Etheridge from the Sun newspaper, uh, Dickie, can you tell us what happened when you took out the Pakistani captain? <laughs> And he said, well, he said, it was a hot day out there. He said, and I had my shirt undone. And this bloody great bumblebee went straight down my shirt and had to stop the game. We got away with it. Uh, the horse came second, and Lammy's never paid me the 300 quid that I got on for him. So anyway, it was a good result. Very good result. We got away with it. The history of the game, sledging has always been there. But when you sledge, the art of sledging is that you only sledge someone that you can affect and get under their skin. Because otherwise, it's a waste of time. If, for instance, Viv Richards, Alan Border, Steve Waugh. You don't want to say anything to those guys. You just keep your fingers crossed and hope they're still dreaming about the night they've just had. You don't want them to wake up and suddenly remember they're playing for their country in a, in a test match. 
So I remember Shane Warne saying to Ian Bell a few years ago when he came over, they called him the Shermanator. <laughs> now, Bell, he's from Birmingham, and he's a nice lad, but he's not the sharpest knife in the box. <laughs> he spent the next three months trying to find out on Google what, who's the Shermanator or what the Shermanator is. And when he finds, actually gets it up and sees it's this little blonde-haired lad with zits sitting there, in a, in a, he was devastated. <laughs> He did not get a run all series. Every time he walked out, Warney would just say to him, Shermanator, here he comes, and oh, out, <laughs> next one, in. So the, great, the best story, though, of sledging, and I think it's one of the funniest, because sledging can, occasionally it did get out of hand, it went a bit too far, but usually it's a, a bit of humour involved in it. And I was uh, presenting for television in Zimbabwe for the Australia v Zimbabwe test series, and it's in those days when Zimbabwe actually had a reasonably good side. But the rest of the guys are pretty, they're, they're, most of them are part-timers, but they had some good players. Andy Flower, who went to world number one, Frank Patterson, and they had an all-rounder <coughs> called Ed O'Brandis, who was a chicken farmer by trade. But very keen cricketer, bustling, medium quick bowler, and could slog a bit down the order. Now the Australian boys are wrapping up the game, end of day three, day four they've got to get four more wickets, to wrap it up, and they've already booked their tea times at Royal Harare, 2 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. The boys all want to play golf. They're out there, and at lunch, 20 minutes after lunch, they are still need six wickets, or four wickets rather. Zimbabwe are still six down. And Ed O'Brandis is out there batting the innings of his life, swinging from the hip, middling the odd one, nicking the other one over the top of the slips, but at the end of the day, he was still out there. And they've had enough now, the Aussie boys. Now, you'll remember, we've got stump mics, so we can hear everything that's said live. And then we have a two-second delay, so we can edit it quickly before it goes out on the air, which occasionally has to happen. And Glenn McGrath is running in the bowl. He is the worst sledger of all time. He gets it back to front. He gets it all the wrong way around. He is hopeless. And he's come in, and Ed O'Brandis smashes this ball out of the ground. And Glenn McGrath's had enough, and he walks down, and he says, stands there with the teapot, hands on hips, Edo, why are you such a useless fat bastard? And Edo turned round to him as quick as a flash and said, because every time I give you Mrs. One, she gives me a chocolate biscuit. <laughs> now, if you... We are going out live, right? So we've got this... We've heard as it happens on the stunt mic. The Australian boys are rolling around on the floor. <laughs> We have corpsed for about two minutes. Now, two minutes in live television, not saying anything, is a hell of a long time. And we, all they could hear down the line was, <laughs> <laughs> sniggering away. Uh, it, it, was, it was spectacular. And Edo actually, everyone laughed, everyone relaxed, and they, they were on the tee by two o'clock. It was all over. But that was a magnificent, spontaneous response. And uh, Glenn McGrath, even he fell around laughing. He had no comeback. Best player and best team that you've seen? Best team is easy, that's the West Indies. Yep. The West Indies side of the, probably from the um, late 70s uh, through to the, probably the late 80s, early 90s. They dominated everything. They won everything. Uh, they steamrolled uh, every side they came across. And I always remember some of the pundits, the ex, ex uh, players who are now sitting there and everyone's saying this is the best side in the world. And they're saying, well, it can't be. They haven't got a spinner. And I asked a very simple question. I said, well, when the hell was he going to bowl? Because they bowled out every side in 50 to 60 overs and won the games in three and a half days. When did the spinner come into play? They were simply the best. I mean, if you look at that side, the original four bowlers, the, the really dangerous guys, Holding, Roberts, Garner, and Croft. Those were the first ones that hit the shores. And then there was about 12, 15, 16 other guys, and they dominated with the strongest batting lineup in the world. Uh, I mean, Joel Garner, imagine facing Joel Garner. You know, he's six foot ten, and I think he lies a bit about that, so I think he's really seven foot. I think he must have to pay VAT or something on every inch. But he was formidable. On any pitch you played on, he just got it the bounce. And put it this way, he was well proportioned because Viv and I never got into the team bath until he got out. Six foot ten, you've got to be joking. So, but they were the most amazing team that we ever played against. Individual players, Viv Richard, 
uh, Viv Richards would have been the best player in any era. Um, bowlers, any one of those 12 West Indians. And also, uh, I didn't play against Jeff Thompson until after his shoulder injury. But Viv Richards assures me he was the quickest bowler he'd ever played, so that'll do for me. But the best, I think the other one that comes right into that category, and I think if people say to me, whose action should I look at for youngsters to go on to be a quick bowler, Dennis Lilly uh, was a, an amazing guy. And I remember playing against him at Perth, uh, Western Australia, uh, in a build-up game to the first test match in Brisbane. The Australians used to like to send us to the other side of Australia, a six-hour flight, four-hour time change, and then bring us back to start the first test. And we got Perth out there, and I went out to bat, and there was no one in front of square. Everybody was behind me. That's the first clue that he's bowling bloody quick. And all I could see in the distance was DK Lilly and his little gold medallion, silver medallion, shining off the uh, sunlight. I looked behind, and Rod Marsh, who's about three foot eight, he just looked like a spot in the distance. And that was extremely quick bowling. But I have to say, the only thing you ever remembered about Dennis Lee was no one else in front, he'd bowl it. You play the miss, hits the keeper's gloves, and you get down, and Dennis Lee would finish about from here to you, away from me, and he'd go there, and all he did was just simply wipe the sweat and then throw it down the front of your shirt and walked off. <laughs> it's a Western Australian thing, I think, but, uh, but he was an amazing uh, performer, and to come back as he did after back injury, uh, DK Lilly would be right up there. Your fondest cricket memory? Uh, every time we beat Australia. Um, I was lucky enough to play on, I think, five winning Ashes uh, teams. And that meant a lot to me. But you speak to any of the guys now. Uh, Alan Border, who I think was the man that uh, revived Australian cricket. Captain Grumpy, he earned that nickname, but he was reviving Australian cricket at that time. Um, yeah, I think it's always good. And I think to, to win the big games, I, I was at the SCG last night and... It brought back memories. I remember bowling Australia out four for 32 in the semi-final, a quarter-final of the World Cup when Australia hosted it, and we won that game. There's lots of great moments, but I think because of the admiration I have for the Australian uh, sportsmen, I think to beat them, but to beat them in their own backyard any day of the week, any time, is the ultimate. And in the bar? Uh, we used to beat them in there as well. Um, but, no, no, the, 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 I think I played in the right era. But well, now they have the 16 players and the 16 backroom, yeah. and they have lifestyle gurus, psychologists, sports psychology. Now there's the biggest baloney of all time. <laughs> sports psychology. What is that about? I had a guy. I'm sat in the commentary box in Eden Park during the last World Cup over there, and I'm sat there, and this guy comes up. He said, "Can I have two minutes of your time?" I said, yes, yeah, certainly. He said, uh, I'm a sports psychologist. I said, OK, right. Immediately the shutters come down. And uh, he went on about, I've got this theory and that theory. And I said, can I ask you a question before we go any further? Um, I don't remember your name. Who did you play for? Oh, you didn't play cricket. All oh, right, OK. What sport did you play then? Excuse my ignorance. What sport? He said, no, I didn't play any sport. I'm a psychologist. And I thought, well, that was the end of the conversation. Because how he's, going to, he's telling me how I'm going to walk out to the MCG in front of 100,000 screaming convicts wanting to kill me. And he's, you know, he's, you know, you know, a Boxing Day test match. I'm walking out there, and I've had a good, box, a good Christmas day. It's Boxing Day. And you're walking out, and the atmosphere is beyond belief. And unless you've done it, you know, being out there, you've got no idea, no conception. So sports psychology, uh, I treat with the, the contempt it deserves. Um, but it's remarkable now. They have so many people. Uh, we had um, a couple of our lads who joined us recently. Uh, Nick Knight was one of them. Joined Sky. And uh, this guy is now 33, 34 years of age. And he's been traveling the world for the last 14, 15 years. And he gets to us. He doesn't know how to go through an airport on his own. I find that quite remarkable in this day and age. Is that the wind? Or is it a coffee machine? <laughs> a nice takeoff tonight. In 1977, against the Australians, I broke a bone in my foot, and I had to go back to Taunton to have treatment. And I was with the club doctor, and 
to get to the physio department, you had to go through the children's ward. And I went through the children's ward, and you can see children that are obviously ill, they're in traction, or they've got tubes, or they've got bandages, legs in the air, whatever. And there was four guys sat around a table playing one of those board games, Monopoly or whatever. And I said to the doc, I said, are these lads just visiting, friends? And he said, no, actually, they're very ill. And they, by the time you finish your treatment here in about eight weeks, uh, they probably won't be here anymore. And I said, you know, Bull, what, what are you on about? He said, they have leukemia. I said, well, what's leukemia? I had no idea. And he explained to me that leukemia is, in layman terms, cancer of the blood. So I said, uh, and over the few, next week or so of going in and out and seeing these kids and talking to them, I actually said to the doctor, so can we do anything to help? Myself and my wife. And he said, look, we give these children a party just before they pass away because they're uh, drugged up, painkillers, etc. Uh, they don't really know what's going on, so we give them a party, but we can't afford to fund it anymore. So I said, okay, we'll fund it. And we, this went on for a few years. And um, I thought, that's the negative side. What about doing something on the positive side? And I was going down to London uh, for a test match, and I was reading a supplement in a paper, and there was a little story about an eccentric old lady called Dr. Barbara Watson. Now, this old lady was in her 70s, and she used to, every year, she lived on the south coast of England, would get a train all the way up to the most northerly part of the UK, John O'Groats, and then spend the whole of the summer walking back to the south coast. So I went to this press conference and announced I'm going to do a walk, uh, sponsored walk for leukemia in 1986. And they said, OK, where are you going to go? And I hadn't really thought about it a lot. And my wife was thinking he's going to say something like Frankston to Melbourne. And I said, no, I'm going to do John O'Groats to Land's End. Now, my geography was so poor in those <coughs> days that it's 400 miles from the top end just to the English border. And then you've got another 600 miles to do. So it's a 1,000-mile walk we took on. We didn't realize, we didn't know how to do it. We didn't realize that you need Vaseline in certain parts of the anatomy to walk 40 miles a day. You didn't realize that when you have a bath, you have to keep your feet out and you wash your feet with white spirit so they don't get soft. You learn that you have to sleep with your feet raised above the bed, so about six inches up, so all the acids run back in. And then you've got to get up the next day and do another 40 miles. And this goes on for 34 days, and then you're finished. It sounds simple, but we, we had to do it by trial and error, and that's how we did the first one. That raised over a million pounds just in buckets, and that paid for the research centre, which was built just outside Glasgow in Scotland. And we've done 16 walks in total. And what keeps us going is that when we started this uh, 30 years ago, children with the most common form of leukaemia had a 20% chance of survival. It's now 94%. And that in itself is... <laughs> that in itself is why we continue. And we've, one of the reasons I'm down here at the moment is we spent a week in Melbourne uh, talking to some of the guys like Eddie Maguire and uh, Andrew Cox and people like this. We're going to do a walk here in uh, November 2017. It'll be the 17th and final walk that I'll do. Um, and we're going to raise money. And I'm going to have what I call the indigenous sports of uh, Australia, which is obviously football, uh, AFL, uh, union, um, cricket definitely gets in there, uh, and NRL. Yeah, so you've got your, yeah, you've got your four main sports. And so Alan Border, I've asked him if he'll do the, be the ambassador for cricket. And whatever money we raise, we haven't done the other guys yet. We'll work on working on that. But whatever money is raised uh, will stay in Australia. And the idea is we fly into, say for argument's sake, we land in Melbourne. We start in Melbourne. We'll do 15 Ks. The walks, you don't need to do 45, 50 Ks now. We'll do 15 Ks around the CBD. And you've got the walkways so we don't disrupt the traffic. So we can walk in, get these big conglomerates behind us, do a dinner the night before, dinner afterwards. And the target could be as much as $5 million uh, raised. And we'll do each city. So we'll go Melbourne, and then we'll go Sydney, Brisbane, Darwin, uh, Perth, uh, Adelaide, Hobart, and then go down to New Zealand and finish uh, with Auckland, um, Wellington, Christchurch, and Queenstown. And, and that's all in the process of planning now for 18 months in time, because it takes that long to pull it all together. 
So that's what we're going to do. So hopefully, if you're all bored one afternoon and we're walking by, come and join us. Um, we'll get sponsorship going, we'll get sponsorship going, airlines involved, hotel chains, etc. It takes a lot of organising, but I think it could be the most lucrative walk that we've ever done, just on the interest that we've had uh, by just breaking the ice now for something that's so far down the line. So that will be the final walk, and then I'll have to find some other way of doing it. You were knighted in 2007. Can, can you tell us what that honour meant to you and obviously to your family? Well, it's the greatest uh, honour that can be bestowed upon you. And um, I went to Buckingham Palace. The worst thing is you get told about seven or eight weeks before it's announced, but you're not allowed to tell anyone. Now, that's not the easiest thing to do, is it? So I told the wife, because I thought she should know, told the wife and I told my two oldest children. I couldn't tell my mother because the whole world would have known within five minutes. And cometh the day you're allowed to take three guests with you to the palace. So I took my two then youngest grandsons who were then um, seven and 14 and then, uh, and of course, Kath went along. So you, you go in, you drive in, you're all dressed up at the top and tails and you arrive at Buckingham Palace you go through the security into the inner court and you can't get out of the car and uh, we get split up. I get taken to a dress rehearsal, so to speak, shown the protocol and what to do. And the two boys and my wife went taken into the tea, coffee and biscuits and the boys had a great time. They soon found the Gurkhas, who are the personal bodyguard of the Queen, and spent an hour with them before the ceremony, slicing paper with the big swords, which they thought was brilliant and had a great day, and then suddenly they're walking in the corridors of everything they've seen in their school books, but not many people get that opportunity. So I get taken in, and uh, you get shown the protocol. So effectively, if you can imagine a square, the Queen has stood there, I come in from here, you get to the corner, you bow to the Queen, and then you walk to the centre, you turn, you bow, and then she beckons you forward. You go forward, and then she um, asks you to kneel, and then the ceremony is done, and then you stand up, and she engaged you in conversation, um, which went on for about nearly three minutes, which is a long time when she's doing 99 uh, people on that in a, an hour and a half. So, and she has a word with every single person, which is quite remarkable in itself. But then when you've done that, and the Queen, uh, she shakes your hand, and then you reverse back to the point here you bow, and then you get to the far corner before you go off to the press, you get to that corner there, and you turn and bow. I got to that corner and I almost forgot. And I took half a step there and then, oh shit, right. Turned back round, mum, and she was laughing at me. She thought it was quite amusing. And then I go and do the press and you do that. But the thing was the kids and my wife were sat, the grandchildren, up in the box uh, watching all the ceremony. And I get up there and I sit down. And, you, know, you can imagine there's a million things going through your mind. And I'm sat there and the eldest grandson is 14. And he just tapped me on the shoulder and he said, uh, hey, granddad. You nearly buggered that up, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Which diffused the whole situation. But it was an amazing day. We went, then went to Lords. Uh, the MCC laid on a magnificent function. They invited 200 friends I didn't know anything about. I had nothing to do with all this. And they laid on a champagne and canopy reception at Lords. On the big scoreboard at Lords, they put up uh, congratulations, Siri and both of them. And it was, it was an amazing day. And then that evening, there was 40 of us invited back to the library for a, a, an intimate dinner. And around about the final course, it all goes a bit blurred. But um, it was an amazing day and one that will stay with me, obviously, for the rest of my life. Well, Nelson, uh, I was privileged to spend some quality time with arguably the greatest man that's ever lived. When you think that he's been incarcerated or was incarcerated for 27 years in a cell that you could barely get three people in, and every morning he would get up and he'd run laps around this little cell for an hour, just did that, and then uh, he did what, you know, the work they had to do. But to come out after 27 years and to have no animosity whatsoever for your captors and everything that it stood for, the apartheid regime, uh, the whole world, the whole of South Africa changed overnight. And I actually got to, uh, I was standing with him in uh, Monaco when we had the inaugural Laureus Sports for Good Foundation and the presentation, and he he made that great speech where he said the point that he made was that um, sportsmen break down more barriers than politicians will ever achieve. And I think it's probably one of the truest statements ever made. And 
He came up at the end of us, 40 of us on the stage, all uh, leading sportsmen from Emerson Fittipaldi, Sean Fitzpatrick, um, Edwin Moses, uh, Martina Navratilova, Seb Ballesteros, the, the uh, selected 40 for the Laureus Foundation uh, Judging Committee. And he came up and he stood next to me, and I thought, you get a bit nervous, the man's right here, and he just turned, just whispered my ear, he said, uh, you are one of my heroes. And that's a bit mind-blowing. And I, said, I looked at him and he said, yes, what your stance that you made, and made it very publicly against apartheid, meant a lot to all the people in South Africa, all the black people. And then a couple of days later, I got an invitation to go on a <coughs> boat in the Monaco Harbour for lunch, and he'd invited me. And I was there and spent a couple of hours with him. Uh, so I was very lucky in that. But what, one of the funniest stories, my wife was coming out to South Africa. We were there touring, and she got on the plane, and uh, she's sitting there, and she sits there, and she recognizes the lady over there. And it was Mr. Mandela's personal nurse who traveled with him everywhere. He's old and frail by this stage. And she sees Kath, and they have a little chat. And then she said, I'll tell Mr. Mandela, he's just having a little nap now, and I'll tell him that uh, you're on the board. So Kath thought no more of it, went and sat down, had her food, read a book, watching a film, and he comes over and taps her on the shoulder and sits down next to her and chats away for a while. And as he gets up, he said, you know, I'm very, very fond of your husband, but he can be a bit of a naughty boy, can't he? <laughs> and that was his last words to us as a family. But no, he, he was a, a, an amazing guy. Uh, a couple of hours with him was like probably two decades with a lot of people. When you've had 15 years in a <coughs> dressing room and everything's done for you and you travel, and these, are clo these people are closer to you than your family because you spend every day with them uh, in various parts of the world. Um, come the time you retire, a lot of guys don't think about that moment. They don't want to think about that moment. They want this to go on forever. Well, of course it doesn't. And when it comes to the end, they actually haven't made any plans or planned for anything. Some of them are financially insecure. They've just spent the money as it came in. Uh, they haven't set anything up. They haven't set pension funds up. Uh, they haven't done anything. And then we have a real problem. And I was president of the PCA, which is the Professional Cricketers Association. And one of the major problems we had is alcoholism and suicide with extra uh, uh, past players. And it was, it was really quite a, a scary moment. And, and that's what a lot of these guys go through. I was very lucky because I went from the dressing room straight into the commentary box, had a year off. Um, because when you're playing, you can't go skiing. You can't do any of these things I always wanted to have a go at. So I had a year away and then came back and into the commentary box where I've been since. But oh, when I go into the commentary box, I've just gone into a box with the guys I played with and against before. So it's another dressing room. But it is, for a lot of people, a massive move and uh, one they can't cope with. My 22-year-old grandson is actually in the same business. He actually works for Hamptons in London, which is an enormous organisation. And it's taken him a year to get his foot on the ladder. He's actually going to get his first proper paycheck, I think, after doing a couple of properties. Now, you sell a couple of properties in London and you make a lot of money because it's ridiculous, the market there. It's the most costly place in the world to live now. Again, it's, it's regained that number one rank. Um, so I saw what he went through in the hardships at times and the tough times. And when you don't, you know, recessions, we've just come out of a recession in the UK. I don't think it's really affected you guys down here, but it was affected a lot of pe people at home. And so I watched him and he hung in there. And you know, I, I had a saying when I was a player, and I think a lot of sportsmen have something in the back of their mind which they turn to in those moments. And I used to always say, you ride the torpedo to the end of the tube. And people looked at me and they said, what the hell do you mean by that? I said, once you get on, there's no getting off. You've got to go all the way. And to do that, you have to make sacrifices. And in sport, that's usually your family. Because you have this tunnel vision, and if you want to be the best and you want to be playing on, in the same field, on the same oval as the best, then you've got to make those sacrifices. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't matter how good you are. I've seen a lot of guys with enormous amounts of talent fall by the wayside because they haven't had that drive. And it's about drive. It's about ambition. It's about uh, self-belief. Uh, and to be quite honest, narrow-mindedness. You have to have tunnel vision. And uh, you set your target, you see your target, and if you want it enough, you ride that torpedo to the end of the tube and you get there. Uh, but not without sacrifices. So. Um, it's a competitive world out there in, in sport, and I'm sure it's exactly the same when you're in the, the real, real estate world. The opposition don't give you an inch. You've got to go out there and take it. 
and it's exactly the same in sport, and I'm sure it's exactly the same in, in your walk of life. Um, there is no shortcut. There is no fi fast, quick fix. Uh, it, usually, 99 times out of 100, it means a lot of hard work and dedication. And no one else can do that for you, apart from yourself. And that, no one did it for me. Uh, no one, I didn't expect anyone to do it for me. They're, they're going to cut you off at the leg, knees if they can, because they want that position. And that's the way it is. It's a competitive world. It's dog eat dog. And um, it's great when you're retired. You've done it, or I'm fine. You know, I can be as philosophical as I like now. But at the time when you're doing it, you have to be that determined. Like a Jack Russell, you don't let go of the bow. What was your message to the team when you had the back to the walls? When, when your back was to the wall? Well, the every day we played the West Indies. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we battled. I mean, we, if we lasted four days, it wasn't because we weren't trying, it was just because they were so good. And I used to tell the guys when I was captain, I'd say to them, look lads, get through the game. Give it your best shot. We know that we've got to play at 120%, which is no such thing as. You've got to play at 100%. You've got to hope they have an off day and turn up and uh, they don't perform. They, don't, they didn't do that. That's why they're the best side in the world. And the other thing I used to say at the end of the game, right, let's have a count up. Broken fingers? No. <laughs> Arms? No. Jaws? No. Fractured skulls? OK, lads, we're fit. We'll do it again next week. <laughs> and there's nothing really, you can't really say any more than that. There's no point in lying to them. No. Um, my question, question's not um, cricket related, but the walk that you're doing in mm. 2017, you mentioned that the money will stay in Australia. Will that go to leukaemia based? No, it'll go to whatever the other four guys are. Yep. I'll pick a charity, a local one. Yep. I usually try and find something a bit off the wall. Um, uh, but the other guys, uh, Alan Borders uh, has a charity that he works with, and whoever the other three guys are, It'll be divided equally, and every single penny will stay in the country. I, I don't want to take it back to England. It's too much hassle, and it's much easier to make a donation here in Australia. So everything will be uh, earned and raised here, and the rate, fundraising will start very shortly, um, which is the way it goes. And then at the end of the day, the pie's cut up, and all the pie stays in Australia. Fantastic. Do you have dates yet for November? It'll be... Well, the idea is to finish at the Gabba, two days, the Australian leg, before we go to New Zealand, is to finish at the Gabba in Brisbane two days before the first test. That way we can get a lot of the current players to come and do that day. Because it'll only be 15k, so it's easier than them going training for a day. So, And the management have already okayed it. Fantastic. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? There you go. Jimmy. Uh, so a play, play the Barmy Army. They love the Barmy Army. And that, to the extent... On the last Ashes series over here, the Australian authorities for the first test in Brisbane, they split the Barmy Army up. So you had 50 over there, you had 100 over there, you had 300 here, and they just split them all up. And uh, they got wise to that, the Barmy Army, and they soon solved that, and they were all back together by day three. But they're good fun. They're magnificent for the economy of the country. You believe me, you talk to anybody at any of the grounds or anywhere in the proximity of the grounds, you know, you're talking at times up to seven, eight, nine thousand people. And that's a lot of, and these guys, a lot of them, are professional uh, businessmen, and they'll work, not take any holidays, and they'll work, and they'll only come for the test cricket, and they'll come and stay for that twelve weeks or ten weeks, and that's their holiday, all condensed into one lot, and then they go back. There's policemen, there's lawyers, there's all sorts, and they come, and but the money they spend, it is a drinkathon. <laughs> They don't do a lot of eating, but they do a lot of drinking. What drove you? What gave you the fire? Uh, desire to win, desire to be the best. Uh, I don't see any point whatsoever if you're going to go out into that kind of arena if you're just going for the jolly. You, are, you want to be in the kitchen, you want to be in the hottest place in the kitchen. If you don't, then maybe you should be doing something else. So it was just a natural path. It was one that just seemed quite logical to me. What did the Queen say in the three minutes she spoke to you? She then? spoke to me about the charity work. Okay. She, said, she said, I know all about the cricket. She doesn't like cricket very much, and, which I know. And she, she has said, you know, I don't like cricket very much. I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, um, <laughs> because I had tea with her at Lords a few years before that when I was captain in 80. And uh, we talked horse racing because I just had uh, guys. He had just won a couple of good races. And we talked horse racing. She had no interest. Well, she obviously tends to enjoy it and goes and meets both teams, but her real love is horse racing. Well, just one more quick one. What's your greatest sporting moment for you? 
Uh, one moment, I think it's very hard to pick one moment. Um, you have milestones. First time I put a pick for the Somerset, the fact when they registered me at 14, which is the youngest guy ever registered. Uh, you know, there's milestones. Your first, first team game, your first 100, your first five wickets. Um, I, I think 86-7 uh, 80, probably when we were totally written off. And it was the longest tour we did. It was five and just under five and a half months. So I, I laugh at these guys now whinging about being away for so long. For five and a half months, and um, it was the year that the America's Cup was being held in uh, Fremantle. And they had, um, you had the full Ashes series. You had the one dayers, triangular one dayers. Uh, I can't even remember who the other side was. Probably might have been New Zealand that year. And then you had the America's Cup which is a 50-over competition that ran for five weeks in itself. So it was five and a, just under five and a half months on the road. And to win, we lost one game in five and a half months. So that was after being written off by everybody, including our own press. So we enjoyed making them eat their hats. I was going to say, when I was over in the UK um, back in the 90s, I noticed how brutal, and I think it's happening over here now, the press. And you talked about self-belief. and. I noticed that the English really put themselves down a lot and that wasn't helped in sport with the journalists getting on your back. I wonder how, how players deal with that. England's slightly different because you've got a population of, well, there's about 65, 70 million that we know of. Uh, there's probably a near 85 million over there at the moment. But the newspapers is a massive business. And when you've got papers like The Sun who have a, a pool of about five million pounds for every lawsuit, they just pay them off. You know, not bothered because one good story, as far as they're concerned, sells them another million pounds worth of papers. Um, so there was, in the 80s, there was a tabloid war. And uh, it was really brutal then. That was the worst time. And it wasn't, I mean, I was targeted, but so was now, um, uh, Nigel Mansell, Nick Faldo. They had to go at anyone that was successful. They just, it was a tall poppy syndrome. And uh, I'll be honest with you, it was awful. Um, and they, there was no... There was nothing too low that they wouldn't do or go to. Um, and they, that, they've, they realise that now and they've tried to build a few bridges, repair a few bridges, but that, was, that scarred a lot of people for a long time. Uh, you haven't got anywhere near it here yet. But you are becoming extremely PC, which does worry me. Because one of the great things about coming to Australia was you came to Australia, the guys and everybody would meet, you have a bit of fun and a laugh. And you know, I look at this thing the other day where... Um, Chris Gale got lambasted from Pit of the Post for saying, chatting up Mel on the TV. But Maria Sharapova, only the year before, when she won the Australian Open, she chatted up the bloke who was interviewing her, but that was fine. So I, I do find it a little strange. I think the, the line in the sand has been moved a bit. And I think that you can get... We, we went through it. Um, it's strange. It seems that countries seem to go through cycles, political correctness. And I hope it doesn't get too far or go too far. Freedom of speech, have a laugh. Life's too short. Well, the worst injury I had was when I had a major back operation, a fusion of bone, natural bone fusion. The bone was taken off the hips and then fused into the spine. And I think it was uh, three, four, five. And uh, I was out for a year. Uh, I drove everybody insane. Um, I'm the world's worst patient. Um, and I used to find things to do that I would never dream of doing. I actually went and supervised. We had a lake, have a lake at home, and it hadn't been dredged and cleaned out, and there was a lot of silt. So I said, I supervised. I sat there, like the controller. I had a straight jacket on that I wore, this thing that went down to here, and I was on crutches and very limited in movement. I sat there uh, for three months while we did this whole lake, and they took out 50-odd thousand tonnes, which was then moved into the... And we had to let stand in the fields at the back, for 18 months for the acidity to drain off and that was my project and that was I just kept myself ridiculously busy with something I would never even bother with uh, why would I bother with a dredging a bloody lake you know and um, so you do you find yourself going into bizarre areas we did a lot, that's when we did a quite a lot of stuff uh, regarding the walks as well we just had to do something I wanted to come back and play because people said I wouldn't play again and I did and I played for England and opened the bowling again so a bit like Dennis Lee did with his back. So, yeah, you, you have targets. You've got to set yourself targets. When I had the back operation, you know, you've got, you look at your bowlers now for Australia. They, do they play two games in a row, the quick bowlers? I don't think they do. They've always, always got a hot spot. What the hell's a hot spot? 
And you know, an x-ray shows a red area, but that possibly could become a stress fracture. But we've, everyone had stress fractures. Everyone played with them. It's just become this world we're living in now. Everyone wants to sue each other with a petrified. You know, if we plays and he has uh, a serious injury, what happens? Well, you choose to play. No one makes you play. It's like people saying boxing uh, should not be allowed. Hang on, no one makes them do it. And they go out there and they know the risk and the reward. Um, it's the same in all sports. So when you come to Australia, who's on your speed dial and who's not for a beer? <laughs> uh, there's only one person in Australia that's not on the speed dial. And that's a bloke called Chapel, Ian. Uh, sadly, I believe he's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you're a golfer, and what's your handicap? Yeah, I've just come back from New Zealand. I uh, played in the New Zealand Open uh, wow. down there with uh, Scott Strange, was my partner, pro from Western Australia. Good pro, he's won a few times on the European Tour. Uh, we made the cut, but we didn't, uh, we didn't feature in the top 20, oh. just outside that. But that's not bad, there was 180 there at the start, so, so we did quite well. But uh, yeah, my handicap is 10, uh, it used to be 3. Then it went to four, <laughs> then it went to five, <laughs> and now it's at ten, and I've, I feel a lot more comfortable on ten. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, um, yeah. uh, today we've learned about, um, I guess, putting ourselves outside our comfort zone um, and um, you know, obviously trying to grow in our businesses. Um, I guess my question to you is what have you done to avoid self doubt in your career? I, I think again, that's mine. It's you, you program yourself. Um, whenever I was out, it was never my fault. <laughs> and honestly, the boys used to laugh. And they, I come in, I one more. How do I get that delivery? Yeah, and I, just you, you just—it's a mental thing. You just simply shut it off. It didn't happen. I remember the good things. The bad things are gone because when I ride that torpedo to the end of the tube, all that other stuff's behind me and I go forward and uh, I, I really do believe that um, you know, I think once you start filling your head with negative thoughts it's very hard to get out of that um, so yeah I, I just blot it out it didn't happen Keep your positive mindset. always stay positive no, always look at it's always greener on the other side of the fence yeah. uh, or it appears to be but as long as you keep going your line your, where, where you want to go not where someone else wants you to go you're the only one that can determine your own path and uh, that's the way it should be. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. If I'm fishing, I want to catch more fish or the biggest fish. And I go out there and I'll keep working and keep on trying it. And I love my fishing, fly fishing. And in New Zealand, I went and did three days of it there. I, I'm like a, a pig in the proverbial when I'm in fishing. No one else there. My own company, up a river, middle of no, dropped in by helicopter, picked up at six o'clock in the evening up there for 12 hours, 10 hours, whatever, just me, the fishing rod and the river. And you know, I, want to be the, I want to catch the biggest fish, and it's the same on the golf course, I want to win every game. And I think that's half the, half the deal is I keep myself very competitive. Whatever I do, uh, I want to be first. Even now, when I play with my grandchildren, I let them do quite well, but I win. <laughs> and they're three, nine months, three, six, uh, so yeah, but just let them think they're doing well and then just win the game. So, so are people born like that or are they instilled? I don't know, I've never tried it any other way. So uh, that's the way I've always been. Yeah. And everybody I went to school with will tell you exactly the same. Yeah. Okay. Ever since a career officer said to me, do you have those over here? Career officers, you have to go and, like, you start to line up when we're about 14 outside the library and then you get called in and there's a lady sat on a chair and you go and sit down, or it would be a bloke occasionally, and you go in and you sit down. Now then, Ian, what are you going to do when you leave school? Um, actually, I'm going to play. I haven't decided, but it's either going to be uh, football or cricket. Yes, yes, of course you are. Now, what are you really going to do when you leave school? And that was the one and only time I had a conversation with the careers officer. Uh, I walked out. I went and saw the headmaster. I told him what happened. He just laughed because he had to witness when I registered for Somerset at 14. And he just said, come down to my office. And he said, do whatever you've got to do when the careers office is here. I'll clear it for you. And that was the last time I saw the careers office. So, yeah, there was a certain amount of 
determination, I think, and single-mindedness way back when. Thank you so much, Ian.